call out a relation condition meeting from order. I would like to say greetings to all of you for being here. Good to see you. Um, Pastor Smith, can you leave this for a short word? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together. God, in unity, I understand it is a good thing for brothers to dwell in unity. And so, God, we pray that this meeting will be successful in uh, discussing the issues that are facing our community. Uh, we pray for peace in our community. We pray for understanding. We pray for love. Uh, we know that if you bless, we are blessed. These are other things we ask in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. At this time, I will entertain a motion for the approval of our agenda. So moved. Smith. Uh, I am the representative from Ward 1. I am a pastor of Mount Zion First Baptist Church. I'm Sophia Cobb. I have been on commission for several, several years. Um, I was appointed by Ward 2, director of Ward 2.
tell the screen. Um, everybody that knows me calls me Ray. Um, I pastor Pittman Grove uh, Missionary Baptist Church off of Highway 97. I'm also executive director of the public housing for the town of Cowper. I've been doing that. This is my 28th year in housing. So I'm glad to be here. Look forward to it. Excited about it. So uh, next agenda item, um, actually the chief is going to be here. He's on his way uh, from another meeting. Uh, but as we prepare the agenda for this meeting, we worked on the first part of last week. There are a number of things that we uh, were going to bring back to the commission that we had, we had discussed previously. Uh, but as things were unraveling last week and um, a couple of events that happened the, the, the weekend, and had I had received some calls from change the focus we want to talk about and have the police chief here. Uh, not only to give us an update of what has been going on, he's done a lot of that in the last couple of days, but special thank you to But also what we really want to do is have a conversation with him. Uh, so if, if he has seen some things or his department has seen some things in the community and dealing with these incidents that uh, will require some assistance or input from other entities other than police. You know, law enforcement has they do a great job do it. Not, and everybody agrees they do an outstanding job, even though they're challenges. But there are a lot of things that the community has to do. And so that, that's what I wanted this team to kind of feel, feel about is to have some feedback and want each one of you to share what your thoughts and opinions are. Maybe you have noticed some things going on in the community that may be a contributing factor to recent crimes um, spree. Um, and it's not just a, it's what's going on now is just not happening right now. It has hit us impactfully in the last couple of days, the last week or two, but it's widespread. Uh, but what we're here, we, we want to really focus on what can we do to help improve the lives of the citizens in the city of Arkansas. And so um, hopefully the chief will be walking in in a few minutes and he will take up a Go ahead and start the discussion. We're taking notes, we're being recorded. And uh, hopefully, when we leave this meeting, we will walk away with some action steps and things that we're going to do. Okay. Any other thoughts about this? Let's start off with this limited thing. Well, um, what I think back in March is what I was going to do. When we heard of street gang. How is it that we can expand on what we already do? Um, we, we talked about it, uh, or it, it's been thrown out, the terminology has been thrown out about conflict resolution. Well, we already do that. Human Relations Commission does that already. But how can we expand on that beyond just dealing with uh, issues that people have as far as uh, um, a customer with a, a store owner, uh, a landlord, and a, and a tenant? How can we expand on that to include or perhaps create another division of our conflict resolution that deals with, with just that, uh, conflict between people? 
Um, because what we've seen now is that you've seen a lot of con this conflict is between between folk. Um, you know, uh, the lady that goes into the chillers, that's not gang related. Um, uh, the man that kills his girlfriend, that's not gang related. It's, we're talking about how can we expand on what we do, which is conflict resolution. I know that in Baltimore, they have something called Safe Streets Baltimore. And what has happened is, is that the, uh, uh, I think the killings went down to zero. Uh, and what they do is they use community people uh, who have perhaps been in gangs and, and you know have are no longer in those gangs to act as mediators between parties that may have uh, serious, conflict. serious conflict. And and I think that you know for us trying to do it um, and not know the players mm -hmm. and not know the conflict, not know the histor history of the conflict, I think that we could should be able to bring in some people from the community. Uh, who have disavowed uh, the gang life, uh, who have gone through some things, who do still know the players, they just don't play the game anymore. Right, right. Uh, and use those as mediators between these people who are having conflict and let the people in the community know, uh, you know, meeting with the gangs, you know, I, I, I'm into having a gang summit. Yeah. Uh, where we bring in those people, you know, we sit down with them and we say, look, we got to stop this because kids are dying. Um, grandmothers, uh, fathers, people are losing their, their family members. And so what we need to do is we need to be able to uh, use the Human Relations Commission as an opportunity for people uh, to come to us and say, okay, I have a conflict and with this person. And then, um, right, and have a serious dialogue, a safe space where they can go talk about it, you know, squash it. And, and, and I think that, that that will help the police uh, that will help uh, our communities. You know, I, I think that that's one of the ways that we can we can kind of tackle that issue uh, that we see now. And those things have been done too. Yeah, well, yeah, that's what I'm gonna say. Yeah, um, I think there's a so there are strategies that have worked in other places, uh, specifically that the North Carolinians Against Gun Violence organization has put out. Um, I I met with um, Sarah Smith one of the directors over there at the North Carolina Against Gun Violence for Black Action mm -hmm. this week. And um, she sent us job descriptions for uh, violence interrupters, mm -hmm. people who can, and outreach coordinators, people who could do essentially what Mr. Smith was saying, um, you know, serve in a position that are from the neighborhood, you know, from our community that might have, you know, some experience uh, with what you call corporate, you know, gang mm -hmm. activity that you know would need to be thoroughly vetted and trained still um, to do some type of you know interaction with the people that they already know. Mm -hmm. um, but using that as a strategy that's kind of homegrown that we can also have some type of influence over because our dollars are paying for it. And then also you know where the community already has that level of trust. Um, I know that trust building has to happen. Um, that's something that has to be actively done even with campusing. So mm -hmm. even if black action is hitting the streets or NAACP is hitting the streets uh, and the other grassroots organizations, we still have a, a level of um, trust building that we have to do knocking on doors, you know. Um, and, you know, my face may still be unfamiliar to a lot of people, you know what I'm saying? So especially people that don't come out or might have been hiding or, you know, you know, that know or that might be participating in violence. Um, so I think that's a very good approach that's been tested across the state, and I think they already have um, strategies that are articulated and that are written that we can get it, that are accessible to us as a commission. And I think we can maybe appoint uh, one or two people from the community to start working with us to develop in the police department to develop this um, section that's funded by the city that will specifically address community violence to go along. Because the feds may come, but they're going to leave. You know what I'm saying? The police, that they have the resources they have. Um, but, you know, some, some equipment um, can't be replenished without a cost. Some things we know investing um, in technology helps. Like uh, the sheriff's office, who just found a guy with a gun on him after they already searched him down with the, the machine that they had that was paid for it. 
these programs can be paid for through the coronavirus um, relief act. It's already been done in Greensboro and done in other places. Matter of fact, we got a meeting Thursday at 10 o'clock. Somebody wants to come. And then, two, we have to realize that a lot of the conflict that has happened, a lot of the incidents that have happened, uh, it was there, there was a voice to that before it happened. Before it even happened. You know, so the streets knew you know, or had some inkling about what was going to happen or, or what could possibly happen. And so you need people Perfect. that have prevention. Right. You need people that have that ear to the street that know exactly, exactly right. uh, you know, <laughs> that know exactly what these conflicts are, where where they started, who are the players. Who are the players. Be because, you know, um, no matter what you say, the, the police and, you know, the task force, they're still, um, you know, operating from behind the eight ball because they have to be reactive a lot of times. Right, they have to be reactive, and I think this is what we're talking about is being proactive mm -hmm. and, and stopping it before it gets to that point. Pastor Green, go ahead. Um, I think those things are good, but I think those are kind of long-range goals. I think immediately what we need to do as a community is to bring our police chief, our uh, sheriffs together to meet with us, along with our clergy from the community, and to say to them, uh, we gotta shut this, this city down, and we're gonna support you. We're gonna support you uh, because you gotta start stopping people, vehicles, you gotta start checking them, and hey, if they ain't got no issue, it ain't no issue. They can keep right on moving. But if there is, I think we're far past that point because something immediately got to happen, but they got to know that we're supporting them. Absolutely. And we're going to support them stopping for them and not come up against them when they do. I, I, I just think that this needs to happen like yesterday. I mean, to pull them in and say, look, uh, you guys do what you got to do. I want you to know that we're going to support you. We're going to talk to our families and our congregations, and we're going to let them know that this is what's going to be happening uh, until we can get a hold of this thing. Uh, you know, I heard somebody say curfew. Well, curfew is kind of out the window unless you're going to put it at 8 o'clock in the morning. Hmm. I mean, because they ain't coming out at night. This stuff is happening in the middle of the day. So curfew ain't going to help you. I'm in support of working with the police department um, hand in hand with some of what's happening. I think, you know, they are on the front lines of what we're experiencing. I mean, I don't go out there when the when call, when somebody makes a call, somebody doesn't call me about a gunshot. You know what I'm saying? So I understand that. I'm not in support of um, being, um, you know, ramping up, stopping vehicles, and because I think we've seen how that has affected the black community historically and who gets targeted the most. And I think also our resources could be wasted because if there's multiple cars being stopped and half of the cars have the smell of marijuana or someone, you know, that's a person off the streets, but that's resources and time and diverted to other petty crimes, you know, or searches, you know, that we could be seeing in the community um, that wouldn't necessarily go to grandma's. However, I don't know the statistics about how many guns are located during stops and searches. So if it statistically makes sense to where the police department is finding guns, they're finding, you know, uh, thing, criminals during searches, if that's the... Well, I don't know if they're finding guns, but I know that these kids got guns. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so that's the issue to me, yeah. that there are a plethora of guns. It seems to me everybody got them. I think I'm probably the only one don't. <laughs> I might need to go out and get one. But, <laughs> you know, I just think that, you know, we have to do something to shock this community because they're certainly shocking us. I don't think it has to be a, a either or. I think it could be a both thing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It could be a combination of things. I, yeah, do I think the police uh, need to, to, to tap down and, and really put their foot down? Yeah, most definitely. I think law enforcement has to do that. I think they. I think that the, the, the what has happened in these past few days, I think it calls for that. But at the same time, I can't just say that and then not have some other recourse 
where I can stop it before it gets there. Well, that's what I'm saying. We need to continue to work on those things that you all were mentioning. I'm not saying wipe those things out. We need that in place, but those things are going to take time. We got to do something yesterday. I don't think the game summit is going to take time. I think it's, it's just a matter of fact of identifying who to, going to those people and saying, hey, look, man, we got to talk about this. Sometimes we got to make we have to make that conversation plain. Um, we got to get beyond the, um, the beyond the, the, the data and all that kind of stuff and bringing in the statistics. We got to get to the point. Where, hey, man, look. Well, that's what I'm saying. We need to have this conversation because you, 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 you know if you continue on, two things gonna happen. You're gonna be either in the graveyard or you're going to jail. Right. Well, the thing and is, at the point where we are now, they are neither. They're neither in the graveyard, neither are they in jail. But they certainly sending a lot of our folks to the graveyard. That's what I was thinking. And I that's the part we got to stop. The problem is not de gun. I don't believe de gun. The gun is an instrument. But the gun itself, we go after the gun, we're going to miss the problem. That's why I'm that's my clear to miss the problem. And so we're at a point now, if there's any other comment, I want to give the chief time to chime in as well. And then we have some dialogue back and forth. Uh, first, I want to apologize. This is the first 15 minutes. Um, this was on my calendar, but I was meeting with our two resident Superior Court judges. We were meeting with a little longer than had expected. So I, I was first, I apologize for that. So, what, so far, what I've heard, I think both are true. Uh, first, I wanted to say the Rocky Mountain Police Department is made up of fine men and women in sworn and administrative roles. And there are sometimes that perception that we're not out here in our streets doing our job, and I am going to make sure that's clear. They are doing an excellent job um, in making sure that we deal with the challenges, and sometimes I say challenges, dealing with the crime, dealing with the gangs, dealing with drugs, dealing with a whole host of things that we're seeing um, within our city. Um, you may not see, and you don't see all of the things that we're doing in the enforcement realm in the paper. You don't hear me out here talking about it, but does that mean it's not being done? It's being done. We are working with um, many law enforcement agencies in the area before all of this, well before this, including both of the sheriff's offices, but many times the public don't see or hear that. But it is a crime. I think, you know, with all the things we deal with, there are a whole bunch of other things that we deal with that is it truly a law enforcement issue? Mental illness, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Addic addiction, mm -hmm. truancy, conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. These are things that are all thrown, marital issues. It, it's, it all, it all of our social issues are typically thrown on law enforcement to try to deal with as a band-aid at that moment. Which is why I'm glad to see so many of you in this room because a lot of the ideas and the programs you are suggesting, we are investing in any of that in our community. But it is not a law enforcement necessarily role. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to get those resources, those programs in our community that are really the underlying issues within much of this crime that we're seeing. For example, you got many times domestic violence. It goes unseen by many of us. You can be the next door neighbor, you won't see it. But as soon as someone's seriously hurt, someone's shot, someone's killed, mm -hmm. stemming from that marital issue, or it don't have to be a marriage, it could be boyfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend, boyfriend, it don't matter who it is, it blows up out of control. But the stemming issue could have been income, arguing over money, who spent what, what little bit of resources they had, conflict resolution comes into play again, could have been addiction. Someone struggling with something. In a, in a moment where the judgment wasn't the best because they're influenced by the drug or alcohol they're on, it led to someone hurting someone. But who was causing it? When they dial 911, it's us. It's not a marriage counselor. It's not the therapist or someone else to come. It is law enforcement. So I think it is somewhat both. We are doing, I feel, our part. 
Many times it is reactive. And many of the crimes that we have seen of recent days, we have done, I feel, thorough investigation of the majority of all of them, I'm going to say. But the majority of them are the ones that we set this off. We have identified the perpetrators. We have locked them up. They have gone there, gone through the judicial system, but do that mean the problem is fixed? No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so I do think we need both. We need the law enforcement to do our jobs, to go out in the streets and deal with those things that are violations of the law. But we desperately need uh, those social programs that I've heard already to help make our jobs a little bit easier within our community. Now, do law enforcement have a role in that? Yes, we do. We got to continue to try to build that relationship of trust with our citizens we serve. Because if they don't trust us, they're not going to talk to us. So that's why some of these programs I'm hearing really need to be led and started by organized nonprofits within our city. And they can be that bridge between those who are trying to get the services to and whatever involvement law enforcement will have in that can come into around the table with that. But it's going to start with someone providing those services, organizing that, and then whatever role we'll play, whether that means making that connection. We go to a call, and it's, we can identify that this person is going through some kind of mental illness, some kind of crisis at the moment. This don't need an arrest. This individual needs to get treatment. We have a number to call to get those individuals in, in place. We somewhat got that already. We got a crisis intervention team on both sides of the tracks. But it's a whole bunch of other things that we're going to have the conflict resolution when you have the domestic violence issues, uh, financial issues that we know we get called to to step in the home. Who do we call for that? So I do think it's both. I'm thankful that you all are here to try to discuss what programs and things that we may need to help address some of the issues that underlying, underlying causes crime that could occur if those things are untreated. It's almost like a sickness or illness. And you can ignore it all you want. But each and every day, each and every week, each and every month or year, you can ignore something going on within your body. It's growing. It's festering. Until one day, something's going to happen. And many times, it's going to be so severe, it can't be ignored anymore. I can look at sometimes with violence the same way. There are underlying things that need to be addressed. And over time, you start feeling those symptoms keep erupting and showing itself. You have a symptom pop up today, some time goes by. Another symptom pops up two months from now. Then finally, it erupts. And then you have to decide, you know, was this an initial, if we had addressed this initially, mm -hmm. well, my my now is that initial illness that first symptom, would we have avoided some major surgery down the road or some major act of violence down the road? So thank you all for coming. I will be at, I'm able to answer any questions you may have with me. Um, I'm always willing to partner with any kind of um, nonprofit programs that we have currently in our city or programs that we wish to start in our city because I do think there is an opportunity for us to be that bridge. I've said this before. We already have a list of resources of nonprofits within our city. I have our community engagement coordinator updating that list, trying to go out in the community and find out what other resources do we have. Mm -hmm. So that way, if my officers go to a situation, we can pass that list of resources off to specifically identify the one that they need. We want to make sure we do that, put that resource in their hand and make that phone call. And if there's a phone call that we need to make, we're doing it for mental health and addiction. But what else can we be connecting individuals in our community with? Because it's more than just mental health and addiction, it's causing some of the issues we have. Do you feel, Chief Hassel, thank you for what you're doing. I appreciate that. Uh, and I also like that you are visible in the community and that you communicate um, like straightforward for the citizens. Do you feel like you're getting support from the city council and the mayor? Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Over the last several weeks, I've heard it before, I've heard it multiple times, I've been asked in private, do I feel I get the support, and I do. I mean, we've had technology projects when I became chief that has went through without an issue. Um, just the other night, I asked for the expansion of two technology projects, we got it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a secret. Do we have vacancies? There's, 
I don't know any agency in this state. If you know one, let me know they don't have a bank. <laughs> now, people get, when they hear a number, oh my God, black men got X number of bank officers, but we're three times, four times the size of many agencies around us, too. So, you look at percentages. So, yes, we have vacancy. Part of that is making sure that we have a salary that's competitive, comparable to other agencies around us and other cities similar to us. And what's coming July 1st, I'm very pleased with, we're getting a substantial increase in starting salary of our police cadets and our police officers, and that's a great start. And we know they're already committed to another pay study, hopefully down the road in the budget year, to further look at the pay plan, not just for police. I'm thinking of police because you've got your police in front of you, but all employees of the city, but I'm going to be talking about the police officer. So my staff, I got one here, and I was just a few weeks ago in a room filled with police officers, administrative support staff, investigators, and when I announced that, they were looking at it, and then I sent that email out, they were very pleased. So do I feel we got the support? I do. I just had two follow-up questions. Um, how is the enrollment for the Ring Doorbell Camera House Vet Program working? And then also, um, uh, with the, gosh, second Ring Doorbell, and the second one was um, with the, I'll think of it, I can't think of it right now. Well, Ring Doorbell to, Program. Ring Neighborhood. If you have a Ring Doorbell, I want you to be a part of Ring Neighborhood. Um, I, you got me off the law, off the law court. I was just asking this question the other day. We should, as a police agency, be in Ring Neighborhood. Um, and I can't answer if we are or not. We were in previous cities I was in, and we're going to be here if we're not. Because what that does is if you see something on your ring camera, you can share it with other residents in your neighborhood. That video you just had, why is that important? Someone you just seen in your driveway mess around with your car, around your backyard, you want to share that in your ring neighborhood to all your neighbors in your neighborhood. It's also a feature that if you can share that video directly with your local police department. So that's why it's very important. And the reason I come into my mind the other day is because I was just at a crime scene. And the house behind has some video footage that we believe was very essential uh, and we believe it showed the suspect. My officers got the video, but it would have been a lot simpler if they could just hit that button and send it directly to the Rocky Mountain Police Department for us. So I do, I will be looking into that, but at Ring Neighborhood, and Ring Doorback Cameras, we have a lot of those in our community. Many of you in this room probably have Ring Doorback Cameras. And it's, it's also August. There's a whole bunch of other, I know August is another one, the Ring Bells or Doorbells. So many of those doorbell systems have a way that you can send those, a link or the video directly to your local law enforcement. And hopefully, if we're not in the Ring Neighborhood, we will be, because I want to make it easy for our citizens and many citizens are doing this. They're working with us. Okay. That ring doorbell footage, we got that. They gave it to us. We walked knocked on that door. Yes, sir, here you go. Pulled it up, showed it to us. We was able to get it recorded ourselves. Um, but I think the ring doorbell it's neighborhood working. program is excellent. And we're going to try to see if we can expand that. Um, that's, speaking of ring doorbell, I was a little disturbed when I saw, I was here to ask, did the police department have that footage that was seen on the television? But if you had already stated that people were reluctant to talk um, in, in the interview the other day concerning the mind you are, when I saw that a video on the TV, for my first question was, did the police um, have access? So you just answered that question. But the fact the reporter had that video that would be considered police evidence all over the news, that put that resident in in harm's way. Now, how I don't know why the resident would allow the TV station to have it versus um, just leaving it uh, with you all at this critical time. But when the reporter gets up there and said, I got this video from the house across the street, he just has just endangered that resident. Well, you know, um, that question somewhat come up before. Um, we do get a lot of video, a lot of pictures from citizens, businesses within the city. They're, they're helping us. I mean, many crimes are solved. A good number of our crimes are solved because we have a great relationship with citizens and businesses who have given the evidence over to us. And we're thankful for that collaboration. Them giving it to us because they trust us. It has been instrumental in charging people. When I'm talking about 
people not sometimes coming forward. There are many times there is information out there from my citizens. And sometimes, for whatever that reason may be, I'll be disingenuous. I'm just going to tell you what it is. Could it be they don't trust the police? Then there's crime stoppers. There's a tip line. You can give it anonymously. But there are many times there are crimes that occur in our community. There are things that occur in our community, as it was said earlier, before it really hit this, this boiling point that something's about to happen, that information isn't necessarily making it to those who could be there to prevent it from happening. Right. So when I say that we are asking for citizens that if you have information on that crime or any other crime in our city, I'm asking you to please come forth with that. Contact our one of our major crime units, come forward anonymously, contact the Twin Counties Crime Stopper or our tip line. And I even mentioned, you know, uh, fighting crime. Just get the information to somebody. And I'm gonna throw it out, pastors. Give it to your pastors. And then they'll give it to us, but give it to somebody, get the information to us, so that way that information can be looked at compared to the evidence we have, because sometimes that could be the missing piece in solving a crime. Uh, another question, I remember. Uh, so the, you were talking about pay raises for starting starting salaries. Um, how? I, what's the percentage, or are you hiring a good amount of people from Rocky Mount, the local area? Like, there's a good amount of your staff from Rocky Mount living in Rocky Mount, or at least the surrounding areas familiar with Rocky Mount. We get uh, a decent number of applicants, and a good number of those are from Rocky. Many of our applicants are applicants that are going through the police academy. And like I said before, police academy, and I, I am very pleased with citizens from our community and neighboring communities who want to serve the public. But it takes me up to seven months from when they start the police academy. Oh, wow. So if, for example, if someone comes in today, and I guess I can do that background, site, everything today, and I'm ready to roll with them. I, the clock don't start till August when the academy starts. So it's seven months from August that that citizen wow. is even eligible to be a full-fledged sworn police officer on the streets. Now, let me back. Let me make that a little more clear. In three to four months, once they graduate, they take the state exam. Then all the paper must be submitted to the state for review. Then once they're certified, they're a certified police officer. Then you got three months at a minimum. Every officer that's unexperienced must go through three months of own job training with an experienced trainer. Also, it can take up to seven months or more training. But what are we looking for? We're looking for experienced, already certified officers, and we get those as well. But we're getting more sometimes the the ones who want to come into the profession, which we accept every day. Um, so we are looking at with this new raise. We're revamping all of our marketing material mm -hmm. to make sure we push out that substantial increase. Because we're going from 38,374 to 43,902. And you know I know those numbers. <laughs> that is a good number. Yeah. 43,902 is going to be the new starting rate with no experience. Oh, that's what? <laughs> Coming into the certified police officer. And I want to say it's 41, and some change, with us sending you to school to be a police cadet. That is a substantial increase where we were. And I look forward to um, the new pay study that is continues to look at all the salaries and I'm gonna say the police to make sure at a marketable rate. But that is a good increase and my guys um, are very pleased with that. I've had a number of compliments. And now it's not just us. It, it, that rises up to different levels within the police department and all the other departments within the city as well with increases. Uh, I want to ask you two times. I have two questions also. Um, I thought law enforcement officers have to live in a certain radius of the city. Uh, I know back in the day it used to be that way. Uh, I think that, that it was like a mile radius of the city. That it, you had to live there before. So that, uh, okay, that's all. That was back on prehistoric years. Um, in your years in law enforcement, have you honestly seen any type of variable in juvenile crime that is really noticeable, something that um, that really stands out. What's different about juvenile crime now? There are, I don't like speaking without the numbers in front of me because I had just gave my Captain Oak Support Services 
um, this request from my office. I want to know over the last several months mm -hmm. since Raise the Age, how many crimes have been committed by now the new classification of juveniles. And compare that to a year before Raise the Age. Now, I'm, I want to wait see what that data says because I must say also that I am a supporter of Raise the Age. And why am I a supporter of that? Because there is proven data that an individual who goes through the adult system is more likely to come back the recidivism rate is much higher coming back into the system versus individuals who are tried as a juvenile going to the juvenile system. And why is that? Because there are more programs to help those juveniles and keep them from reoffending. Mm -hmm. So looking at that from that viewpoint as a police chief, who wouldn't want that? I would want a young man or a young girl to be able to go through a system that has the resources to help them from, to continue down that path of commitment, whatever their offense may have been. So I was a supporter of race age, and I'm, I'm still a supporter of that. Mm -hmm. But I do want to look at the data to see, have we seen more juveniles since the race age? And that may be a topic totally off base, but I want to see what the numbers suggest to me so I can better answer that question for you. But I was on the phone this, this morning talking with a juvenile probation officer. I don't think he's still a juvenile. I think he's just retired. And in that town and city he lives in, they have seen an increase in crime. I was talking to another friend of mine in another city, and they have seen an increase in crime. So I went back to my juvenile friend. You know what? I just had a question posed to me. It was someone else about juveniles and their involvement. He said, Chief, we're seeing it. More juveniles it appears have been committing some of these crimes that we're seeing in our city. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the crimes that we're seeing, I did the report and update, they are young adults. They're in their late teens or in their 20s. Um, so to give you a better answer, I'll have to look at the statistics, but do I see a number of juveniles, 16, 17 years old, committing crime? Yes, I do it early, in that early 20s. Mm -hmm. um, have we had any recent activity that um, should make us concerned about sex trafficking happening in this area? Not in terms of my attention, but sex trafficking is a concern. Because um, many times females and sometimes males can be sex trafficked and they can be raided in your neighborhood and you won't even know it, forced to do things that they're not uh, they traditionally or wouldn't normally do. Um, so have I had a particular case that come recently on my, on my desk that I've seen in our city? No, ma'am, I have not. But does that mean it's not in Rocky Mountain? It does not mean that. Chief, I was, um, you know, one of the things that I've found with young people is that uh, a lot of times, and, and not just young people, but people don't know their rights. They don't know what rights they have. And, um, I lived in another city, I, I, we had like a little rights card, and we, these are what your rights are. Because they had an issue with, as soon as the kids saw the police, they jumped and ran. Yeah. And so, with the little rights card, when the police stopped them, they said, hey, I got my rights card. The police knew about it. Um, you know, and they would ask questions, you know, why am I being stopped, blah, 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 whatever, can you call a supervisor? And, and we found out that the amount of crime went down, uh, as well as those kids just running who hadn't done anything, just had them get for police. So uh, can we, first of all, can we do something like that? And second of yes. all, in Rocky Mountain, and then, and then sec and, and, and it, what it did was it helped re relationships between policemen and our youth. Uh, the, the, the second thing is, is that what can we do in the faith community to, to kind of help alleviate some of the issues that you deal with that are minor offenses, where, you know, if you stop someone or, or, you know, they might be belligerent or whatever, and, you know, they can say, if, if they're in the Half Hill community, we know what churches are there, and pastors sign on, whether, you know, you call a deacon or a pastor, and you can say, Pastor, we have Cooper Blackwell here, he's in your community, um, he's being belligerent, da 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 can you come to the, wherever? Hey, look, Cooper, I need you to calm down, because these are the communities that we serve. You know, and we, you know, we don't, I, I don't want people to, you know, be in jail and, and that kind of thing. I want them to be able, let's see, how can we fix this problem? What is the, what's the issue? You know, let, let's get to the bottom of it, you know, and, and in a way where, yeah, law enforcement was there, but the faith community was there also to say, okay, I got it. Let me take it. Let's find out what the issue is. It could be employment. It could be addiction. It could be whatever. And then we get them the help that they need if we can because 
that would be a powerful intervention there. Um, as an intervention. Yeah, I don't, I'm, and I don't want to sound like I'm saying to you we need to lock up kids. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying to you is that if they are stopping vehicles, and let's just say there's a smell of marijuana in the car. Well, the smell of marijuana, I don't know if that's a crime or not. I don't know anybody that locked up because they smell like marijuana. But my thing is, if you're getting high because you're ready to go do this drive-by, now that we need to know, because you can't do it sober. You gotta be on something. Yeah, the smell of marijuana gives the officer reason to then search the car. Or right, that's what I'm saying. So not, um, you know, and, and, and yeah, we're gonna, they're going to have to be trained. There's going to have to be uh, some community involvement. Because, no, I don't want kids being targeted uh, of color or any color. Mm -hmm. But I just think our community now back is against the wall. And so we got to do something immediately. And, and you know, um, let me go answer the first part of the question. We have in the past done Know Your Rights sessions. Oh, yeah. I mean, and so, um, yeah. it's been a while since we've done it formally, but I have recently, um, we've um, done two sessions at Wesleyan College, soon to be Wesleyan University. Yeah. But right. we have done two sessions with criminal justice students up at Wesleyan, myself and my executive staff, about um, some of the issues we see in our community, about how we need to build relationships with our community knowing your rights. We've had a series of questions coming from those criminal justice students. Mm -hmm. um, and there has been some discussion about bringing those sessions back about know your rights. It wasn't a card that was given out, but it was a session where, well, let's say we have it here at a local church or some venue, and whoever wanted to come, and the police will make sure we have to answer those questions. If you're stopped by the police, what can I, I can and I cannot do? And we're open to having those kind of conversations. Um, to the point that the pastor was bringing up earlier, I remember as a rookie officer um, in Kenston, over in Mid um, Jack, not Jack Jack Brown Street, let me get it right, because somebody may be watching <laughs> over there in um, Simon Bright Apartments. And we won't quite at Simon Bright Apartments, but it was a guy we got out on, I can't remember, I think it was a description given out, and we got out on him, and he took off running. Many of you think, okay, he fit that description, that must be our guy. <laughs> so we ran and we ran and we ran. I was much thinner, <laughs> less gray hair then. Finally, after running a few blocks, me and my, my partner, he tripped on an old light pole that was, I don't know if it was intended to be like a car bumper or something, stuff, but he tripped over up in the Simon Bright apartment area. We got him, quickly identified who he was. He won't the guy we were looking for. <laughs> No check warrants, no warrants, no nothing. Why are you running? Because I want to know because I done ran them blocks. I they tried to get out on me. Right. Was it a trust issue? Maybe he had a previous bad experience with law enforcement. But he ran and he had nothing. He had no drugs, no gun, no warrants, no nothing. So do we need to continue to build a relationship of trust? And that was I've been in now 26, 27 years. That's been probably 15 plus years ago, if not longer. There was trust issues in parts of our community then. When I say community then in general terms, and there are still issues of trust right. with law enforcement today. And every action we take, it's like that you walk in that line. It seems that the actions that we're taking now, is it ruining the trust that we have worked hard to build with members of our community. And many times, it's gonna be our communities of color if we're being totally honest about it. Crimes happen somewhere, not crime, I'm even more specific. Incidents happen with law enforcement somewhere else. George Floyd, Taylor, you name it, there's an interaction with law enforcement, some death or serious injury. It didn't happen in Rocky Mountain. It didn't happen in none of the other previous agencies I worked with, but it's like dropping that pebble in a lake. Mm -hmm. The ripple effects go all the way out, and we feel that here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it helped, it hurts trust, even though it won't us doing it. It hurts with recruitment, and it even hurts retention. 
because those negative interactions and they were wrong and if you don't have trust already built in your community locally it still affects that trust. even if it is of high trust but it still hurts it here it hurts with the retention because now you have officers who don't feel as welcome maybe i don't know if that's the right Same. word Same. that they're in a profession mm -hmm. that you hear so much negativity about law enforcement all the time and it's to the point of like, now we got the salary up better, but whatever it is, you know, I can go work over here, make a lot more money, and I can sit in the office behind a desk where I can drive a truck. Mm -hmm. And you have many truck drivers make good money. Right. Plumbers, AC repair, if you call them your house when you need them, you find out what the bill is, they make good <laughs> money. Good. Um, more than public servants. And there are many law enforcement, I've heard this many times from the chiefs around the state, they are leaving to go into other careers, other professions, because of the climate we're in. But does that mean we stop trying to build those relationships with trust? It don't. So that's why it's that balance act. Doing our job as police, enforcing the laws of the state and our city. We got to do that. We're gonna to have to deal with the dope dealing, we are. We're gonna to have to deal with the gang, we are. We're gonna to have to deal with those issues of mental health and everything else we deal with. Addiction, we gotta deal with that. And we do the best we can with what we have. But we do need the community to continue to help us find those pro programs and resources put out in our community. Which goes to my second question, Pastor. I don't know if your congregation is where the issues are many times. Right. You go to church, you're at the pulpit, you know your parishioners, you know your congregation. Many times the issues that we're seeing are those who are not in your church. Correct. They're, they're outside the church. So whatever way the church can help and building some program that can go out into the community and take it to those in need will help us out. I'm not gonna say family values. I do think the family unit, somehow there is a breakdown in many homes. And I'm not talking about a husband, a male, female, husband and wife type family, single fathers, single mothers, grandparents. Are now they raise their kids out of home. Now they're raising their kids' kids. Somehow programs that go out there and help identify those issues that they may need to deal with the kids. Because many times it starts off a little Billy or a little um, Juliet, or I'm not saying right there, I'm sorry. It starts off not listening. <laughs> then it starts off not listening to the teachers. Then it starts off skipping school. Then they're hanging out with the wrong people in the street. Next thing you know, you get a call, he or she is now involved in some incident that many times won't even perpetrate by them, but they're in the middle of it. And then they still hang with them next day. No, next time, they're now running with them individuals who are not of a good influence. I remember, as a young, you know, another officer, and I'm sorry if I'm taking too long, but I like to give you stories, because my life experience is who you got in front of me today, and how I feel we do need programs. I'm do anything I can to be proactive, anything I can be preventative, I'm gonna do it if I can, within reason. And I'm gonna support any community group in the community who can do that for us, because it makes my job easier. But I understand what I have to do as a law enforcement officer, and I'm gonna say this time, law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I sometimes say peace officer, but just to be clear, we're gonna to have to do law enforcement, and we do that too. But I remember this young man who was on the street corner, he was probably 15 years old. This is no lie. Sergeant Harold, he was a sergeant at the time, he retired as a major of the Kansas Police Department. So that way I can Google, anybody listening can Google that and verify my story is what it is. He was my sergeant at the time. There was this young man who was on the corner with older boys. Those guys were drug dealers who had sold drugs for years throughout the city. He was with them. There was on occasion, this young man, we get out on the corner, we know they're selling drugs, he takes off running. Going back up towards Kinston uh, Indian State. It was Kinston Indians then. I can't think what they call it now. I should know that because they got out there. But the stadium, the baseball stadium. Called him, didn't have anything on him. Once they had a large amount of cash, he was the guy that held the cash. So when the police come, you know, they got dope hit somewhere, but he always didn't want to run with the cash because he didn't want to get the drugs and cash together, of course, because you know it's going to get seized. But we had this conversation with him. By hanging with these guys with negative influence, you keep hanging with them, you want to do them, but keep getting in trouble, they're going to be using you. He was a juvenile and took him home to his grandparents. 
his father and mother, I think, had passed or died or some other, for whatever reason, he was his, he was then taken care of by his grandparents. Told them the story. He's been seen multiple times with him. Within one, two, three years, I get a call. She's an FBI agent now. I'm not going to say her name, but she's now, she's elevated, went to SBI. Get a call. She was a, tech, a detective there with cancer. Found a body at the landfill. Mm-hmm. Had been stabbed, I believe it was, multiple times. Hassle, that's what we in law enforcement, paramilitary, all talked about last night. You would never believe who it is. It was that young kid. He done, been, he done elevated from now holding money to now selling drugs. And someone addicted to drugs, I'm going back to that addiction in our community, something went wrong. And the guy ended up stabbing and killing him to death after multiple times stabbing him. And his body was dumped at the landfill. So the problem, the symptom was truancy. He's hanging out in the streets with bad influence. That was seen early on. We need some way to get him from the street corner into a program to help him get on straight and narrow because what did it leave him at the landfill after being stabbed multiple times by someone who was addicted to drugs? Well, Chief, you're right um, the fact that a lot of times in our churches, we got kids, and it's not that our kids are not involved. It's just that a lot of times we don't want to believe that they're I remember a few years back when uh, Sheriff Atkinson was on the Highway Patrol, and him and I used to do a lot of stuff with kids with gang and gang violence with drugs and equipment. We used to bring them together. I remember that. And we used to bring them to the church to have conversation with them. Well, one night I brought in my kids so that we could have a conversation. And I was blown out the water when these guys walked in and they started speaking to my good church kids by name. They knew each other, oh, yeah. moving in yeah. the same circle. Yeah, by name. My kids that were in Sunday school, Bible study, by name. And so uh, I, I, I don't know that it's not that our kids are not, church kids are not involved. It's just a lot of times we don't want to see them. And I, I can see that I've had many incidents where we'll stop cars and there'll be kids inside and they're with someone who have been convicted of drugs, still dealing drugs or using drugs, and in their mind, I'm not smoking, I'm not selling, he is. But where are you at? You're in that car with them. Um, that happens more than we realize, so I would just throw out as parents who may be in the room, know where your kids are and who they're hanging with, because there are some of our young kids, maybe even young adults, who they feel like, well, I'm not the one doing it, but you're in the house with them, you're in the car with them, you're hanging in places with them, and when things happen, they pop off, as some of you will say, a bullet ain't going to have a name. So know what your kids are getting involved in, um, because it could be a situation that may have some, some very horrific effects. That's a, so I hope I answered your question. I don't know the exact answer, to be honest with you. Anything that the churches can do as far as outreach to get out, and I know many of our churches are doing that now. They're getting out in the community, helping you know with food and securities. They help. I know there's a job there coming this weekend at George Church. A lot of our churches are doing things, but what else can we do? This is a starting point. Come up with a great solution great program, hopefully find funding, and hopefully push that forward. But working together, making sure that we're working together on a program and not everyone doing multiple different things of this, trying to tackle the same issue. I think you'll have a more, more quality program by all of us working together, making sure that, that one program is going to solve our issue, hopefully address an issue together. Chief, one last question. You came in at a great time discussion that was going on, and you've also kind of touched on that, and Chairman Hill touched on it as well. You mentioned four, four things here, and if you could share with us, so the commission would kind of have something to lead for some direction and where we're going. What do these, would you say, would, would need or require or, or 
appear to be um, the greatest need right now. You mentioned drug addiction. You talked about conflict resolution, domestic violence, and mental health. We get a lot of mental health. Um, I was just talking about our health care providers. Out of, they gave me the numbers, it was probably, let's say out of 160% of individuals that officers are coming in front of, coming in contact with in the streets, at their homes or in the streets, that we feel need some kind of mental health. Mm -hmm. And what recourse, we're not mental health professionals. We just know something with this individual that's going through a mental crisis. We, with our CIT, our crisis intervention training, we can identify. So we go to the master, we tell them what we have to get an involuntary commitment paper, we take them to the hospital, and then when their professionals evaluate the individual, so wrong. 60 65%, <laughs> they don't need commitment, they need follow up with the mental health professional. So mental health is definitely one. But addiction from some of the mental health professionals I'm talking to is really one and the same. So, but I'm gonna throw out addiction because overdoses, people who are addicted to um, whether it's methamphetamines, you know, any drug that they have, um, we're seeing the effects, especially with fentanyl out there in the streets, you know, meth and everything, overdoses. Uh, so we may get there, the fire department, the police department, EMS, we can deliver that Narcan to save their life. And it has happened numerous times. Second time, save their life. But there may be another time, police, fire, EMS don't get there. Yes. And we already knew that someone is struggling with addiction. So I would say um, addiction uh, needs to be another thing, area you need to deal with. Relationships, and I would throw that in conflict resolution. Um, I think sometimes with domestic violence, I'm not so sure about young girls, or young boys, sometimes they know what a healthy relationship is. Mm -hmm. um, maybe from upbringing, maybe things that were surrounding their environment, I'm not sure. The conflict resolution, domestic violence, I'll put that all there and together. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we see the symptoms that we go, it's arguing that end up leading to physical, and then if it's not addressed, it eventually is gonna lead to physical violence, and next thing you know, it's gonna be a bottle or a knife, or so something with, with relationships, conflict resolution, anger management, somewhere in that area, I think, is that third biggest thing I think we need to be looking at. Um, diversion programs, I believe in enforcement, but I also believe in second chances. I can't stand here and say that I don't believe that individuals can change. So diversion programs, um, that's after we've done, been called and done our job. Especially for the lower level things with our youth. Um, and helping them get that resource and hopefully they have a diversion program that is working with the court system that can put them in to get the resource they need and hopefully they don't be a fear and then somehow the courts involved, that may not be something that's gonna affect their record because believe it or not, I've had too many individuals in our society and the places I've worked before that they are trying to get a job. But nobody will hire. And what do we as citizens think they're going to eventually do? Right through the streets. And I'm not talking about the big manufacturing companies making 16, 17, 18, 19 dollars an hour. There are some of these guys that work anyway. I've seen teenagers who got family support them. I ain't working for a I ain't working at McDonald's. I ain't working fast food, period. But these guys will look for any job and they are told no, especially when they reveal their criminal record. Um, there are programs out there. We just need to get out there. Like I, I went to, maybe not too long ago, let's start over. It's like a reentry type program, helping connect individuals with employers who are willing to give them a second chance, even if they got a pass. And they had some very good success stories up there, making good money, well above minimum wage, who have not reoffended. And then also, I think there was a program to help them get housing. And and everything else. So those are my top three, but then I do think we need to be thinking about some way in a, about somehow getting those who have made mistakes in the past, somehow getting them transitioned, some kind of active employment, because 
there was an instance I've been in right now, the last story. There was an argument over money, which led to a child getting injured. And I can't say much more of that because I don't know what's in the Bible I'm talking about. It started over money. If they didn't have a money issue, would that have not happened? The argument was about money. He then took it out on a child, I guess to get back at the child's mother. And then I had to deal with, unfortunately, my officer. Oh, yeah. You may say, why? What do you mean, your officer? What the heck he do? Did he take the money? No. <laughs> because all these hacks that we see in our city, we're there. Mm -hmm. We're human. This badge don't make us, don't shield us right. for what goes on around us, guys. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I know you know that. I'm speaking to the choir. They sometimes say pastors. Mm -hmm. I won't say that because that wouldn't be who he is, but. It affected him, thought about his situation, and about their desire for children. And then you got somebody who would do that to a child. To a child. Mm -hmm. And that's all him and his wife wants, is a child. Are you doing his gun by that? Or, or? We did that three, well not three years, we did it three times mm -hmm. multiple years ago. Um, and I, I, I can't remember which meeting that was in. I had my staff pull in that to see how successful that was. Um, there are some things like the buybacks that many times what police parts were seen are revolvers that don't work, uh, guns that wasn't even operable, but the, the, the mission behind buybacks is to get the guns off the street. But give me a gun without a gun going, they don't work. I don't need that. That gun ain't hurt nobody. I don't care who you are. You can pull that through all you want. It ain't gonna work. Um, some of the buyback programs have revealed that all we're getting is junk. Um, now, are they effective, sir? I can't sit here and say they're not, but I can't say they are either. But do it get some guns off the street? Yes, it does. But I'm not so sure what part of the gun you're really getting. Is that the gun that's really out there that is, is involved in some of these crimes? But we are looking at that because it was done what ten. Years ago, Captain Navy? It was about 10 years ago. Uh, and they did it three times. And what I want to do is find those records, look at evidence, because there will be documentation. And if I can pull that from my, if it won't have already been destroyed, if the judge has given us an order on a buyback, then they already destroyed. But if for some reason it's still in there, I want to see what we were getting. How many guns we get, how much did it cost us. And if we're getting nothing crappy guns, then is that what we're going to expect to be doing today? Will your, um, just quick question, will your report, your crime report, I know you all put out a, put out a report, right? Yes, sir. We do it monthly. Will it, will it monthly? You want the report I do for the city council? Oh, no, okay. Okay, come on, yeah. different kind of report. Is there a yearly report this Um, time? We're bringing that to Rocky now. Okay. Um, I can't say, have we ever done an annual report? Yes, we have, but it's, and we do one at the end of the year. No. The, uh, I think he's referring to an annual report that's published. Oh. It comes out at, well, if you look at the uh, January crime stat, that is basically the yearly report. Okay. So you, now we do one that looks a whole lot prettier. We haven't done it in a couple of years, but me and the chief will bring that back. Okay. So, so that's what I think Mr. Scooby are looking at is we do our reports monthly to the council, but I am looking at bringing back an annual report that, that gets a variety of area, areas, crime statistics, initiatives, programs, that kind of thing. Will, and it, will it specify gain? Which, how much crime is gain, like gain activity? Because there's like a, there's a concept, misconception about that. Too, mm -hmm. you know that. There's a series of things that, that we're required to report to Kalia as a part of our accreditation process. And, and that's where those stats really come from. Um, we'll get a lot of that crime data, demographics on who we're, who's applying for the positions at the police department, who's hiring, things like that, uh, to see where our demographics are. Many, many different aspects we have to report on, and the next year will probably be our first report in this And will the bank like to be in there to report a section of my previous reports? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I just say yes. <laughs> and have I been looking at gang spaces already? Yes. I'm looking at arrest sheets, and I'm looking at all the arrests that we make and all the incidents that we have in our city. I already been looking at those reports, and what is the percentage of those reports are involved in those that we know are validated gang? I'm already looking at that. Because it's not, and that's not something I just thought it. I mean, I get that question sometimes. 
we look at that, we monitor that, we have a gang unit, we're looking at those. So they will be included. Thank you. And I wanted to be aware that um, LSC has a SOAR program that they received national recognition. It is a reentry program. Um, it helps uh, not only with getting them uh, employment, but also train, train them as far as if they need their uh, GED. But the SOAR program is a second chance program as well, and they've received national attention. Awesome, Some great information shared. Uh, I, 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 we don't want to leave here without the next step. So thank you, Chief, for sharing that information. Now, for the admission, no, we, the conversation started with a couple of things put out there. Uh, any feedback as to what the uh, next step be? What, what direction do you propose to make I know a lot of things going on. A couple of different groups is having some, some meetings. Yeah, maybe combined. But there is a red joiner doing something too, right? Uh, now, if I go to yeah, right over in Ward, uh, great distance position. I mean, I would be glad to help commission staff. Uh, some, I mean, fill up seats for us if we want to do something separate. Do we have a budget or something for that we for spending? Because I think part of the issue is communication. Okay. And I think that, you know, like you, like the, the Know Your Rights mm -hmm. cards, maybe that's something that we can publish and then distribute, you know, as a commission. You know, maybe we take a day and say, hey, come on, we're going to go to the neighborhoods or whatever um, and distribute these things along with a flyer that says, turn on your lights after 9 o'clock um, or something. Your por turn on your porch light. You know, maybe as a commission, we could say, here's an initiative that we can do right now, we, and we can get some stuff printed mm -hmm. to start, or maybe we mail it out, and say the Human Relations Commission you, commission is urging you to do your part by turning on your lights and by knowing your rights, or something like that, you know? And that's something immediate. That's not, that's still not, you know, talking to people face to face, but it's that first point of contact, like, okay, they're, they're they're attentive, they know what's going on, and they're coming to the community, you know. You know, Archie, I, I mean, I like the idea, uh, I like that idea as well, but um, we have two gentlemen in the room who are pastors, and uh, there's no denying that pastors are still very important people in the black community. Um, they carry a lot of influence, and you'd be surprised at how much influence a pastor would have on street gang members themselves. They tend to respect pastors um, because of the respect thing. You know, the respect thing with them is real big. Uh, but whatever we do, I believe it has to have a strong presence of our pastoral community. I think so. Just a moment. Yes, I, I, I'm not part of this. Keep going. I hope it won't feel like interjecting. But let's say, and I'm, I'm throwing this out myself out there, let's say you come up with want to try to address addiction or if you want to try to address mental illness you want to try to address domestic violence or something what I know I can do is we have a full-time crime manager we got two positions mm -hmm. one coming next week I'm looking forward to her coming on board we have a crime manager unit so if you're trying to address domestic violence my crime analyst can identify where we have a high concentration of domestic violence so if you're looking at going out into the community yeah. and want to go target right. before it blows up to some really violent thorn spur, we can let you know where we're having a, a, a high number of domestic violence situations, or we're seeing a high number of mental health situations in one particular area, or we're seeing a lot of overdoses in one part of our city. So you know where to go put those flyers out and start trying to figure out what, how can we connect the resources to those who may be in need. So that's something I know we can help. If you have it, you want to be strategic and go where the need is, I think that's where we will come in to help the nonprofit or human or relations and get you in the right neighborhood. This is a start. Yes. And you're not just doing going in everywhere, wandering where you're going away, wandering. We can at least help you get where you need to be in the neighborhood. I have a quick question. Yes. 
my sisters have such a, a huge respect that they moved their office out of Rocky now into Nashville, and since then, has there been an increase? Because at one time, they were very active, but I do know um, a while back, they moved the office, which it should be in Rocky now, and right. that's where most of the domestic violence situations are happening, versus taking it all the way to Nashville. Well, they have an office in Nashville, that courthouse. And I think they also have a toddler. They also have a chef in you know, Rocky Mountain. That chef is not. It's, 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 it's well, I'm not saying it's full. That chef is not. I mean, it's, it's, it's kept secret. Right, the clothes. Yeah, it's kept secret. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, Chica, you can provide that. Because they also talk about youth and comfort. So just give me those particular areas you're looking for, okay. and I can have our analysts talk about them. I say, oh, okay, I ain't gonna cheat, give me something else to do. If you give me those top things you're looking at, I can tell you where we've been responding with those issues, and that may give you a little more insight about where to go. Where to go, just if, it's, if you think it's helpful. And, and why, you know, I know that we're saying, um, let's get it out to these target areas, but we, we got schools, we got two superintendents. Yeah. We need to be able to, to impact it directly by getting that information into the hands of the students. Mm -hmm. You know, um, how they gave you coupons. Yeah, you're right. You know, get them cards out to the students. Talk to the superintendents. Yeah. Bring them in to uh, to a human relations or special call meeting. And say, look, this we know that this is going on in the city. We know that our youth are involved in this. Look, let's let's get this information out to our kids. You know, this is from the human relations commission. Let's get in there and get our our officers and our our, our police. Uh, officials an opportunity to talk to these people and human relations people an opportunity to talk to after an opportunity to talk to these young people. Okay. Because if it, I, I don't want to wait and say, well, it's impact on this, so I'm going to go over here and I miss somebody. Mm -hmm. I know you're in school, let me go on here and, 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 and get you now and talk to you now and deal with you now uh, and have it where you can take it home now. You know, and you, you never know how we, we will impact someone to say, you know what, they were right, this ain't working. You know, and, and, and they've given me resources. Like this weekend, like you were talking about employment, you know, at the church, we're doing employment. But one of the things that I told all the employees, I said, when you come, you have to agree uh, that you will hire the first thing, yeah, yeah, that you will hire. Interview. And not just interview. And I have a number of them that are foregoing the, back check, the background check. They're saying, you know, because they, they are really in need of workers. And so, I mean, th th those are the kind of things that we have to do in our community um, in, in order to to, uh, to help these people because a lot of them don't can't get gainful employment. They don't have transportation to get to the job or get to the interview. So I'm going to bring interview to them. And then when it comes down to the fact that they can't get to the job, we're going to use the church van, uh, find, you know, do it some way. Look, we, we done paid our mortgage off, so we, we, we don't have that excuse anymore. So we're going to use our van and we're talking to some other churches to use their vans help these people get to work. Help Auntie, me. is, is it, um, it sounds like this is, um, this is starting to take shape. Is, is there any way uh, you and your staff, you've heard all that's been said here, you've heard the many ideas that have been thrown out, the many things that could come together in the form of a program that would be facilitated by the Human Relations Department. Um, taking steps towards really making, putting some, some substance to this mm -hmm. and put it in the form of a proposed idea, uh, maybe, uh, as opposed to starting little bitty committees, uh, and, and I'm just throwing this out there, um, just, you know, the, the commission just act as a, a body that is helping facilitate this with your staff support. Yeah, we are here to, that's why I wanted some, some kind of direction of where I want to go because staff is here to support and pull it together. Yeah. And help, help, help make that happen definitely. Mm. Mm -hmm. How does that sound? We also need to bring in our neighborhood presidents too. I mean, absolutely. We need to have a meeting with them. And to be with these pastors. I mean, yeah. that, the group of pastors you can get together, uh, that has been very effective in the past. Mr. Elijah. And send a loud, clear message, Pastor Green that we're serious about this. Uh, it's pastors are still the leaders of the black community. I don't care what anybody says, they still are. You pull them together. That's why I was saying if you could pull uh, clergy along with law enforcement and, and uh, the human relations community to come in and say, look, 
we're going to support you guys. That's all I was saying, that we got to let law enforcement know we got their back uh, so that they can be okay with what they got to do. Yeah. Because some, somehow we have got to do something. Yeah. And let the community know you got the police back. Right. You That's know, what I'm saying. Let the community know yeah. that we're supporting the, their efforts here. So, Archie, as you, you begin to put some structure to this, uh, the, the, the pastoral component, you got two pastors here, you know, in terms of how soon something like that could happen. Could you serve as a contact point? So, yeah, what we're going to do, we, you and I will be interviewed in communication direct out of this meeting. Okay. Kind of put that draft together. Okay. And we'll reach out to you and get that as also, and that will be our next step. And so uh, there may be a call meeting, and uh, could be get a lot of things going on. You and I will be here. Yes. Talk also. Uh, but we will definitely get our next meeting. And so if we don't know when we meet in June, like a vacation, but, but my thought is, and you all can comment on that, with all this going on, we really need to have we a need to. We, yeah, yeah, we, we need to. Yeah, we need to. 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 So we definitely know we have a June meeting, and there's probably going to be a meeting in between that. That sounds like a word. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Any other questions? Chief, thank you for your input, information. But you see how important it was. I told the judge, I said, look, y'all, because I got to go. I apologize. This other meeting was on my calendar, and I knew what you had to talk about was important. I wanted to be involved. When does your new analyst come on? Hopefully. Is that Monday? When does she come on? Monday. She's going to be a great asset. <laughs> that group's from Rocky Mountain. Good. So she's right. coming back home. She has experience working as a criminal analyst in the um, in a um, real crime uh, real time crime scene. So she was a strategic analyst. So to be able to get that experience in bringing to the Rocky Mountain Police Department is, is amazing. We have one analyst already four times. She's doing an amazing job too. So to have them both together, I think it will make our team even stronger. And we'll share her name when she gets on board. I can't say anything about that. Yeah, I know what Thank you. Are we ready to adjourn? All right. Uh, thank you, Chief, for coming. Thank you so much. Thanks for what everybody is doing. Uh, welcome again to our new members. And if there is no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. 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 Second.